Okay, well, welcome everyone to the uh, training program of the I2B2 Transmart Foundation. Um, today's session uh, will be an introduction to I2B2. Um, as usual, the session will be recorded and the recording and any slides will be available within a day or two on our website. So if you go back to the training page on our website, uh, you'll be able to view the entire recording uh, of this session. <clears throat> Today's class is an introduction to the I2B2 platform by Marin Wenberg from the University of Kansas. And we'll get to, um, to Marin in just a minute. Uh, just a, a few um, logistical points. Uh, everyone is on mute. This is a GoToWebinar meeting uh, to ask a question or get our attention. There are three ways to do it. One is through the chat window. Uh, one is through the question panel where you can post a question. And finally, you can raise your hand. And uh, I will, uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone um, from the foundation, and I will remain on the, the entire call and uh, try to keep track of questions and things that come up. We'll try to answer them during the course of the session. And then there'll be a, a question and answer period uh, at the end. This is part of a, 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 a training program for the entire year. Uh, the future upcoming classes are listed here, and uh, again, you can see that on our website and uh, register for uh, these other classes. Um, they include training in both I2B2 and in Transmart, uh, and uh, each class has a particular topic, either uh, introduction or particular topics uh, in using the platforms or data loading, different types of things, as you see here. Um, and so we, uh, we thank you for your participation. Please share with your colleagues. Uh, who might be interested in a future class uh, or if they'd like to view the, um, <clears throat> the recordings. I do have um, two quick questions we'd like to ask you all just to give us uh, a chance to, um, to uh, see who's, you know, who's there. Uh, so this is a poll to ask you, um, how, do you know and that you're using I2B2 or Transmar uh, already? And so if you could Click on this uh, window. You should see this on your screen. <clears throat> uh, we appreciate you, your information. So thanks, everyone. Um, I guess about half of you are using I2B2, 13% uh, use Transmart, and 40% of you don't know about much about them. So um, it's an interesting result. Thank you for participating there. And then uh, the second question is if you could give us a little information about how you plan to use the platform. Is it uh, part of your research in your company or part of your academic research training? Uh, are you a supporter of people in your company uh, or are you maybe a vendor? Um, and so we have about... Uh, Two thirds are using it to support um, people in your company, and one third are do using it for academic research, uh, roughly. Okay, that's great. Uh, I do appreciate that. Um, so now uh, I I will turn it over to uh, to Marin, who will give us the introduction to uh, I two B two. Let me change presenter. Okay, Marin, you should be able to select show your screen. Okay. okay. Am I trying to like a switch which screen I'm showing? Yeah, you should be able to. But I, I, yeah, I can see your. Um, can you see the I2B2 here in overview? Um, yeah, it's gone now, though. Yes, I think I see three screens, or two screens at least. Okay, here we go. You should be able to, yeah, pick one screen. There you go. That, that's it. That's now you can one. see it. Yep. All right. Um, so I will go over an overview of I2V2, and locally we call it HERON. I'm from the University of Kansas Medical Center, um, and please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. Um, definitely, we welcome participation. So we'll go over, you know, how we set up access locally um, for HERON, why you might want to use HERON or I2V2. Um, we've got some um, participant registries which are linked with I2V2. I'll go over over some of our training resources, um, share some basic search techniques, review available data, 
and then just teach you how to search in I2B2. So in order to access Heron, which is our version of I2B2, um, people must be sponsored by a faculty member um, or be a faculty member. They have to complete their human subjects training, study training, and then they also have to sign our system access agreement. Um, and it's only available locally here at KMC, uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center, or we have people access it through the VPN. Um, so in order to access it, people will see login credentials. We show that to them visually. Um, and if they have three check marks, then they're able to access Heron. Um, it creates the Start Heron Search button, and that will be lit up once they've got their training. So about Heron, we combine multiple data sources. So here local, locally, we have EPIC, um, which we call O2. And so we bring in data from EPIC or O2. We bring in our billing data, which is from IDX. And then we bring in various registries, such as the trauma registry, the cardiovascular disease registry, the cystic fibrosis registry. We de-identify everything to remove all 18 HIPAA identifiers, which includes the patient name, address, MRN, et cetera. Um, we do date shift because part of um, an identifier is anything except for the year. Um, so we date shift for a patient um, from one to 365 days in the past. Um, so this is an example. You'll see patient one. Um, their date of birth might have been 1-1-1950, and their asthma diagnosis was 4-1-1965, and it was offset minus 60 days. Um, so that would appear as if it was November 3rd, uh, 1949, and February 1st, 1965. So it's consistent between a patient, um, but then here you'll see we've got patient two, and we have their date of birth and their hospital admission, and that was just as minus 20 days. So for the most part, this is fine for our researchers to use. The times that we say it's not um, won't work as well is if you're looking at a policy change. Um, so if the new policy went into effect in November 2017, and you want to look at how providers treat other patients before that change and after, um, you would want identified data. Also, people are looking at seasonal changes. Um, that de-identified data will not be as good for that either. So um, one of the reasons to use I2B2 is to find the number of here locally at KUMC patients who meet inclusion or exclusion criteria. Um, that includes things for current applications, feasibility counts. Um, and this is just an example of what the query would look like. So you can build your inclusion or exclusion criteria and then see how many patients are eligible. You, um, we allow people to requ request raw data. So we only let faculty members actually make the request. And there's a Heron data request button that they can click. Um, so that's useful for retrospective studies. They can request the identified data set that no IRB is approval is needed. They can also request identified data sets, which requires IRB approval or QI letter of determination from the IRB. Um, this can also be used for prospective studies, so they can request data on patients that are already in a research study, and that requires IRB approval. Um, they can also recruit, so we have the Frontiers Registry and the Pioneers Registry. Um, and so people can look for only patients who are a part of the Frontiers Registry. So those are patients who have been seen at KU and have agreed to be contacted for researchers. That allows the researchers to contact them directly without going through their treating provider. Um, we also have the Pioneers Registry, which is a national registry. Uh, anyone can sign up for it, um, but we do host it here at KU. And then we also post studies that patients can sign up to say that they're interested in participating. So training resources at KU, we offer at twice a month lunch and learn, and we give free pizza to anyone who attends, and we also offer a, a yearly fishing trip, um, and we do group training, so department training. Um, so those are some of the ways, if any of you are um, on a workers at your site, um, those are some of the ways that we, we have dealt with training um, all of our users. We also have a lot of online training, which is accessible for people within KU and then also outside of KU. Um, so it's linked on our Heron website. We have all these online train, training um, pages, but I'll also show you how to get to them um, from outside of KU. Um, so some of the training pages include Heron instruction, facts, Heron training manual, 
uh, videos which are on YouTube, how to request data, how to receive data, um, sponsorship, and then the registries, and also understanding free text. You know. So the website is listed below. And our YouTube channel is KU Medical Informatics. We've also incorporated training resources within here in our ITB2. And so we have a help which is specific to our I2B2 instance. Not all I2B2s have built that out, um, but if you wanted to add that, you could certainly talk to us and we would could show you how to add that in. Um, so that gives links to training videos and some more facts. There's also the Heron help, which links to our team, and I2B2 help, which is standard with I2B2. So we're about to get into Heron, um, and this is the cohort example I'm going to lead you through. Um, when researchers have a question, um, you know, they typically have inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and then additional variables that they're interested in studying. So for this case, we'll look at diabetes by both ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Um, patients who have a family history of diabetes, uh, who've had a hospital length of stay for more than two days, and then we'll exclude anyone who has um, passed away or is zero to 17 years old. And then the additional variables that they would like to get out in their data set include insulin use and hemoglobin A1C. So we'll look for those as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and start searching. All right, so this is the main Heron homepage, um, with, which you already saw a lot of the links um, in the PowerPoint. So, um, here is where patient, uh, people can see their logging credentials and make sure that they have the three check marks. Um, before we provide data to anyone, we do have a data use agreement set up that everyone must sign. Um, we do ask everyone to cite um, the CTSA award and papers that, um, and Heron for any papers that come from using I2P2 here at KMC. So that's just some information that we have on our site. Um, and then we can just click start Heron search. From the upper left, now this is a fairly standard view of I2B2 across all sites. So in the upper left, you will see navigate terms. And these are all of the terms that you can search on. You'll also see a workplace. Um, and in here, every user has a folder. And then we have a shared folder um, that users can share their queries between individuals. We have our previous queries listed below. Um, and so you can see we save all of the previous queries. Um, so that as users run them, they can always look back on the other, other queries that they've built. So before we start diving into making a query, I'm just going to go through some of the data that we have. Um, so we've pulled in alert data from Epic. So this includes things like the best practice advisory alert. We've also pulled over allergies, cancer cases from the cancer registry. We've organized it in two ways. We've organized it as a layperson hierarchy, so a little bit less detailed information, and then also from the NACER hierarchy, which has all of the data. We have cardiology lab results, which includes our echocardiogram, device checks. Um, we've got the cardiovascular registry, which we've brought in, the cystic fibrosis registry. We have demographics, diagnoses. Diagnoses is, um, is categorized by ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. So ICD-10 is the newer, newer coding system, but some patients will still be coded with ICD-9 from uh, previously. So we typically recommend looking for both. We have flow sheets, which is where the nurses or occupational therapists, physical therapists document, um, do their documentation. We have history. This includes family history, social history, um, where there is tobacco usage, and then also surgical history. You can open and close these folders, so I'm just going to minimize these back. We have lab tests. We have laboratory tests by the KUH hierarchy, which is our local hierarchy, um, and then we have it by LOINC, 
and link is a national standard. Um, so when we share queries across sites, we typically would go with um, the link hierarchy because the other sites would have those same link codes. We have medication. And here are some of the different categories of medication. And we'll look into searching that in a little bit. We've also got microbiology tests. Um, orders, that means that it's been ordered, but not necessarily that that test has been completed. And you have procedures, um, which have CPT codes and then ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. We have the ability to link with REDCap projects. So we have brought in REDCap projects for various users, and they're found in this REDCap folder. We also have as patients are enrolled in a research study here at KU. We have specimens from our assessment repository, trauma registry data, visit details, which is where we house things such as what department were they seen in, here's the clinical service department, how old were they at the time of the visit, what were their discharge disposition codes, so where did they go to after the hospital. Um, so if they went to an acute care facility, if they were discharged alive, things like that. We've got the encounter type, so if it was an outpatient encounter, an inpatient encounter, um, provider, which we only provide for identified requests. We do not provide that in our de-identified data. And then we also have visit vitals, such as like height, weight, BMI. We are currently working on bringing in visit notes. So here are some of the note types that um, we're working to de-identify, and then we'll bring them in hopefully in, in another month or two. You'll see, once it opens up, you'll see um, we've got ambulatory progress note, um, there is going to be an operative note, h and um, so a lot of different note types that might be of interest to researchers. Finally, we have Visient, which is, used to be called the University Health System Consortium, and that's the inpatient quality data. Um, if you notice when I hover over each of these folders, it gives a little bit of information about the folder and how many patients are in there. So this was quality data reported to Visient. This includes information about inpatient hospitalizations, hospital length of stay, it's found under the UHC visit details, and we have 148,000 patients. Um, so we added that, they're called tool tips. When you hover over various things within I2B2, it will tell you information about it. Um, and that just helps users search throughout more. So I'm gonna open up demographics. And I'm going to start by opening up age and looking at patients who are zero to nine, um, or 10 years old, or 11 years old, or 12 years old. So zero to, 11, oh, zero to 12, and you can click Run Query, and you can name the query, otherwise the system will auto-name. So I can type in zero to 12 years old, and I've chosen number of patients as checked. And we can click OK, and it will run. See down here how long it's been running for? So it ran for about four seconds, and then told us that there are 84,000 patients. Um, so when you put things within one group, it says or, so it's zero to nine, or 10 years old, or 11 years old, or 12 years old. Now, I might be interested in how many females are zero to 12. So within demographics, I can open up gender. And drag over female. So things between groups, you'll see it says and. So now this is saying that they have to be zero to 12 and female. And I can click Run, and again, I can name it 0 to 12 and female, and click OK. Now this one's taking a little bit longer to run. It's about 20 seconds so far. 
Are there any questions so far? Uh, I don't see any have come in, but um, anybody wants to raise your hand, and I can unmute you. Uh, I don't see any. All right. Well, we've got 30, almost 39,000 patients who are 0 to 12 and female. Um, so that's just a very simple example. So we'll go ahead and we'll try to do the cohort example that I uh, shown before. So our inclusion criteria will be diabetes with a family history of diabetes and a hospital length of stay greater than two days. So my typical process, if you don't know the ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes, I recommend Googling. So if we typed in diabetes ICD-9 code, we see 250.00. Typically, Google will get you into the right ballpark of of the diagnosis code, but will not, not always get you the exact right diagnosis code. So we can open up diagnosis and ICD-9, and we will navigate towards 250.00. So all of these are numerical. Um, so here in endocrine, diseases like other endocrine glands, and then diabetes mellitus. So that's 250. The actual code on Google said 250.0, which is diabetes mellitus without mention of complication, and then it said 250.00. So it would actually be this very specific diabetes mellitus without complication, type 2 or unspecified type, not stated as uncontrolled. Um, so if that's what we were looking for, we could drag that over. But instead, I'm actually interested in just all of diabetes. So I'll go ahead and drag over the higher level folder. Um, so that's something that I, when I talk to researchers, I often let them know they have the option of choosing, you know, how specific they want to get. They can get very detailed and go all the way down to the least of the very last term in the tree and pull that over, or they can pull over a high, higher level folder. So we're going to just pull over the 250. Um, and sometimes when you open up folders, it can be slow to open up for the first time. So it's just thinking and taking a little while. Now the ICD-10 code, I already know. It's E08 to E13. And I can use this find and click search by code. I can select a coding system. And I can scroll down and choose ICD-10. And I will do E08 to E13. Now, when I drag this over, I'm going to put this in the same group. I'll put this into group one so that it says uh, they either have diabetes by ICD-9 code 250 or by ICD-10 code E08 to E13. I'll click on query and I will it in and click OK. So we can go ahead and look for the next thing, um, which is family history of diabetes while this runs. So I will close these folders and open up history, family history diagnosis, and then endocrine. And here's diabetes. Okay, so we have 92,000. Um, patients, almost 93,000 patients with diabetes. So I can go ahead, I'll open up the diabetes type 2 folder. And then you'll see that there's a negative history of diabetes type 2. These blue circles are called modifiers, so it's, it's, um, it's describing the diabetes. So this is a negative history. And then all of these are um, positive family history. So this whole folder is saying that they have some family history. I could get even more specific and I could say I want it to be a daughter who has type 2 diabetes or a son or a maternal grandfather. But I could also just take this whole, um, this whole folder of family history, which says that somebody in their family had type 2 diabetes. I'm also going to open up um, type 1 diabetes and I'm going to do the same thing as pulling over family history. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And I'm just going to let I2V2 auto name my query for me.
So while that's running, um, the next thing that I had as part of our inclusion criteria is a hospital length of stay greater than two days. And so I will go back to Vizient, which is where we keep our inpatient quality data. And open up UHC visit details. Length of stay. And hospital length of stay. Like I say, I can build, I, I'm not going to be able to rerun a query until the run button comes up because this one is still running, um, but I can continue to build my query. So I'm going to go ahead and drag over hospital length of stay. And anything that's numerical, it's going to pop up and say, um, do you want to say less than, greater than? Um, so I'm going to say greater than two so that it's more than two days and click OK. At the same time that we add in this hospital length of stay, we can, okay, here we go. So we've got 30, almost 32,000 patients with diabetes and a family history of diabetes. So now we'll go ahead and run the hospital length of stay and see how our number changes. I often recommend people run their queries sequentially so that they make sure that it makes sense. Um, if you see that your number went from 30,000 to zero, you would know you know, that probably we might have built the query wrong or something seems a little up to you. So the next thing we're going to exclude patients who are deceased and any pediatric patients. So I can click new group and that's going to add a fourth group here. And over here I'm going to click demographics and we have age. So I'll pull over a zero to nine or 10 to 17 and I can click exclude, and now you'll see it says, and none of these. So all of the things in this group are excluded. I can also open up vital status, and that's where we have our deceased. And so we pull over the vital status from O2, or EPIC. So I'll pull over this deceased, and then we also have deceased per the Social Security Administration. So I'll pull over this deceased as well. So we don't want anyone who's passed away and anyone who's zero to, 11, or zero to 17 years of age. Um, I think it was about 11,000 that popped up down here um, or who had the hospital length of stay greater than two. So now we can run this again and see how many patients meet our criteria. So this is um, all of these patients should meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So. So this button is Resize Workspace, and I clicked that to make this Navigate Terms take up the whole length here. So I can click that again and make it smaller. I can make any of these large. So if I wanted to look at the previous queries, I could resize that and have that take up the whole screen. Um, it looks as if I'm only seeing the last 20 previous queries, um, but I can click Show Options, and I can increase this to the last 200, the last 2,000. Um, and here we go, here's the last 200 queries that have been run. Now here locally, we've set up our, our I2V2 so that administrators of I2V2 can see everyone's queries, but users can only see their own previous queries. Um, so we have 8,739. If I were to clear this out, I can click the clear button, and that gives me a completely new slate. Um, but if I wanted to continue working on that query that we just built, it is down here in previous queries, and I can click on it and hold down on my mouse as I'm dragging it up and click on and drop it to where it says query name. Now it all repopulates and it shows me the number of patients who were eligible. So 
So one of the other things um, that we might want to do, we might want to say that um, right now this is treated independently and we might want to look at patients who had their diabetes recorded during their hospital length of stay. So I can change this to say selected groups occur in the same financial encounter. So now this is saying we have patients with diabetes and we get the choice. So we get to say what happens at the same time. You see this, now it says occurs in the same encounter and this is the drop down. So some of these groups can be treated independently and some can occur in the same encounter. So group one will say occurs in the same encounter and we're interested in patients who have their diabetes recorded during their hospital length of stay. So I want group three to also be occurred in the same encounter. But as far as the family history um, is concerned, I'm okay with that being recorded at any time. So I'm going, I clicked the drop down button and clicked treat independently. And that means that the family history of diabetes could have been recorded a year before their hospital length of stay or a year after their hospital length of stay. It could have been recorded at any time. Um, but they will have had diabetes recorded during their hospital length of stay that was more than two days. Um, for uh, demographic information, you always want to treat that independently. Um, we only record gender at the first visit. Um, so it will never have the same encounter number as the hospital length of stay unless that was their first visit. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this as a curse in the same encounter and we'll see how our numbers would change. I would anticipate that they will drop at least a little bit. So you've seen the navigate terms. We used the find and search by code. So you can search by many different coding systems. We've got the um, CPT codes for procedures, we have ICD-9 codes, we have ICD-10 codes. We also have search by names, which I'll use in a minute to search for some medications. Um, here is the help button that we have incorporated. So we have a link to our training videos, a link to some facts, um, running previously constructed queries, how to do that. Um, so just some basic information. We've also got, um, we try to release data every month. Um, we are a little bit behind right now. We have data through November 2017. <laughs> so, um, but we keep track of that up here. With each release, we call, um, we have, we're on Heron Lizard right now. I think the next one is Heron Calumet. So they are, for us, we use lakes in the area. And every time we release new data, we choose a new lake to honor in our region. <laughs> Um, okay, so this came back with 7,323 patients. I think it's about 1,000 less than the last query. So um, again, running them multiple times, that makes sense to me that maybe some people would not have had, you know, who would have met all of those criteria when they were independent, but putting the same financial encounter for the hospital length of stay and the diabetes would drop the patients. So, one of the things that I said in the, when I set up the cohort example, I'll let you take a look at it again. So we've done our inclusion criteria and our exclusion criteria. And then there were some additional variables that um, this person would want to get back about um, in their data set if they were to request data. So they might be interested in insulin use and hemoglobin A1C. As far as insulin use, we can use the find and search by name to find insulin. Um, but if you were to search for just insulin, ICB2 would come back and say, we found, you know, tons of results and it would, it wouldn't necessarily show you them all to you. So I always recommend finding a brand name of insulin. Again, I just Google what the brand name of insulin and I found Humalog. So we'll go ahead and click on find, search by name, containing, and I can say Humalog and, and now to the, search any category in I2V2 or we can limit it to a folder. So I know I'm searching for a medication. So I'm going to click on medications and click find. <laughs> and now Heron comes up with a whole list of Humalog medications. So again, we have our tool tips and I can hover over these and I can see where these live in our hierarchy. 
So when I hover over this, it's in hormone synthetics modifiers, blood glucose regulation agents, insulin, and that makes sense. Um, not all sites will have your data set up exactly the same, but some of these search techniques could still be useful to you. We have, um, I believe it's called RxQE, that's what that HS000 is, um, for different categories. And so it's, it's easiest for me if you look down the list, it's the last one is HS501, it's listed right before the insulin, um, and so I can just remember that, and then we can navigate there easily. Um, I often hover over a couple to make sure that they all live in the same place. So when I hover over this, it's also in that HS501 insulin bucket. We can hover over this hemolog. Again, it's in the hormone synthetic modifiers, blood glucose regulation agents, and then the insulin folder. So we will go ahead and go there. If I click on navigate terms, I'll open up my medication and I can scroll down to now that I remember HS501, I can find it by alphabetical and then um, numerical. H500 is the blood glucose regulation agent. And then HS501. So I can choose only to look at Humalog or only to look at certain ones, or I can just choose all of them. Uh, and again, you can treat this independently, or you can say for the same encounter. I'm gonna go ahead and say, treat all groups independently at this point. Um, I don't care if they're in the same encounter or not. I'll just pull over a couple of the larger ones. So we'll look at insulin, we'll look at this insulin, Here we come. So 1,400 patients had that. So I'll see if these patients have had any of these insulin. Now, if the researcher was actually requesting data, they may want the whole insulin folder, but for the purposes of this training, I'm only interested in these particular insulin, um, insulin values. Now, I'm guessing that this will be much smaller than our 8,000. But I'll show you how to make the number go back to 8,000. Since this is not an inclusion criteria, we don't want it to actually decrease our number. We want it, um, you know, we just want to get the data out of them. Here you see that it's been running for 60 seconds, and this one um, might time out, I'm not sure. Um, at 180 seconds, we have it set up so that our queries time out, and that means that it runs in the background. So it's still running and users can then pull up their query from the previous query section to see if it's finished. So sometimes they can take up to 20 minutes, um, but oftentimes they're under the 180 second limit. So I'll go ahead and close these. If you right click, you can say refresh all and that closes all of the folders. So if you've gotten very deep into a hierarchy and you want to just collapse everything, um, you can just right click and hit refresh all. So in order, I'm waiting for this to finish and guessing that it will be smaller, um, but in order to make it be the, the whole cohort instead of you know, the smaller version who've had these insulin prescribed, we could pull over gender because everyone has had a gender. Um, I'll wait to do that to see if this finishes. I get 40 more seconds and then pull it over. Any questions so far? Anything that you want demoed specifically? I'm happy to do examples that 
not anyone online has as well. Yeah, so far I haven't seen anything. You can raise your hand also and ask the question verbally. Okay, we got our answer. So it's 3,969 patients. It finished just before it was about to sign up. So about half of the patients have been on one of these insulin at some, at one of these, um, had one of these types of insulin ordered at some point. Um, but again, I did not want this to be an inclusion criteria. I just want the data. So I'll go ahead and pull over gender um, because this tells the computer when it searches do they have this kind of insulin? No. Do they have this kind of insulin? No. No, 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 no. Do they have a gender? Yes. Everyone has a gender, so then they will be kept in the cohort. So when I run this, this should go back to the 8,000 patients that we had. <coughs> so here we have users set up their I2B2 queries. And then we let them request data and we'll pull the data for them and give it to them in a long skinny file. So we'll give them four CSV files. Um, one file has a, all of the patient information. One file has data um, and it's one, one row per fact. And then um, we will give them a variable table and a code table. Um, we also upload a summary into a REDCap project for them. Um, and if any site is interested in, in doing something like that, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Now, the other thing that I was interested in looking at was hemoglobin A1C. So I'll show you how to search for that. Um, it's a lab, a lab test. So we can go ahead and search by name. And instead of any category, I will choose lab test. And I'm going to search our local hierarchy. and Type in, type in A1C and click Find. So um, I2B2 is not like Google. It does not do any like smart searching. So it only searches exactly what you type in. So if hemoglobin had have been abbreviated HGB and I had have typed in hemoglobin, we would not have found it. Um, so sometimes it takes searching multiple times to find something. Um, but I would definitely recommend you know, searching a couple of times until you find what you're looking for. So we can go ahead and we'll look at the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and if I hover over it, again, it shows me where it is on the hierarchy. And I always recommend people go back to the hierarchy because they might find similar things around it. So this is in lab tests, the KUH hierarchy, and then in chemistry, and then general chemistry. So navigate terms. We go to lab test KUH, and then again, it's, I have forever, it's chemistry. And then general chemistry. Now sometimes there will be a long list here. So what I like to do is use control F, and I'll type in hemoglobin, and now I'll get, it will highlight all the instances of hemoglobin. So we did have a question, we'll Marin. Yeah. Um, the question was, can you explain why you added gender to group five? Sure. So I added gender um, to group five because I don't want to limit my patients um, to only those who've had insulin. And if you recall, when we did our original search of the diabetes, the hospital length of stay. This is our treated independently group. Um, we had, sorry, let me pull that back up. Um, we had 8,739 patients, and these are the patients that I want to study. Um, but now I want some extra data on them. So I want to know whether or not they've had insulin or not, but I don't want to exclude them if they have not had insulin. So let me pull back up that query where I added in the insulin. And our numbers dropped to almost 4,000. So it almost dropped in half based on 
based on the patients who had those specific forms of insulin. I did not pull over every kind of insulin. I only pulled over the specific ones. Um, so only 4,000 patients had been given any of those kinds of insulin. Um, but again, I want to study our 8,000 patients. Um, so we call it here a shopping cart of variables. So it's almost like that's going into my shopping cart um, of things that I want, but I don't want only 4,000 patients. So this might be specific to how KU pulls data, or it might be relevant to other sites. But when we pull data, um, we are pulling based on the number of patients in the query, and then any term that is listed in the query. So that's why we need the insulin added into our query. Um, but I added in gender um, because everyone has a gender. So when it does the or, because it's in the same group, um, all those patients who don't have insulin should also be included. So I wish that it would finish, but when it finishes, I promise you the number will be um, the exact same number that's listed here. It will be 8,739 um, because everyone has a gender. So when it says, no, they don't have insulin, um, you know, they do have a gender, so they'll still be included. Um, does that make sense? I'm not sure who asked the question, but I don't know if that makes sense, or I can try to explain it again. Um, Let's see. When we run the query, we... Oh, God? Um, Jungwon Chow, I just unmuted you if you'd like to. Did that answer your question? I said yes. Okay, great. Okay, yes. Um, so we'll go back and we'll find the hemoglobin A1C. And we could add this to our shopping cart as well. And again, um, anything that's numerical, we could specify that it has to be less than a certain value or greater than a certain value, or we can just say no value. So I'll just choose no value. I just want to know what our hemoglobin A1C is just based on it. So I'm adding that to our shopping cart so that I'll get it on all of the patients who met our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so because it's got that gender, now it's the shopping cart. So you can um, run this query. Yep. Oh, God? No, uh, we're getting another question on, could you please do another query with temporal constraint, with a temporal constraint? With the defined sequence of events or with the selected groups that are in the same financial encounter? Uh, let's see, Cindy, yes, yes, that's what she wants. Which one, the defined sequence of events or the selected groups that are in the same financial encounter? Uh. I thought it was the first one. The design sequence of events? Sure. Um, right. So I will go ahead and clear out this query. And if there's some, something specific you want me to show, I can do that. Otherwise, we do have an example here for the design sequence of events. So um, I was going to look at patients who had hypertension um and a heart attack and who were female and say that the heart attack had to occur before hypertension by at least 30 days um so i'll go ahead and do that unless um you want to unmute and i can do whomever example either way so if we're going into this example i'll go ahead and i'll click cindy well, if you want it oh, yeah? i've unmuted you cindy if you want to ask the question Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I didn't sure. know how to how to um, use the temporal constraint to make queries. Uh, there are four options um, from in the pull down: uh, treat independently and oh, the three. Okay, I I didn't know what what how to use those. How to use these? Okay. Yep. So we did the selected groups occur in the same financial encounter. If you will recall, in this query, we put um, the hospital length of stay in the same encounter as diabetes. Um, but now we can go ahead and we'll do um, we'll do the defined sequence of events. 
So I'll drop down and I'll choose Define Sequence of Events. And I'll click on Find and Search by Code. So I know that the code for uh, acute myocardial infarction is 410, the ICD-9 code. So I will go ahead and let's see where I, ICD-9. So 410. acute myocardial infarction. And then I'm also going to do 401 for hypertension. And then I'm going to limit this to females, just so we don't have as many patients that we're searching. So I'm using the find and search by codes, just because I know the exact codes that I want to search for. Um, now, if this was a study that you were doing, like I said before, I would definitely recommend also including the ICD-10 codes, um, but for this demo, I'll just do the ICD-9. So this is the population in which events occur. So it's saying that I want, you know, acute myocardial infarction and hypertension and them to be female. Now, the next drop down is event one. So in event one, I'm going to put in um, my acute myocardial infarction. And I'll pull that into event one. Event two, I'll say hypertension and pull that over. So when you're building a temporal query, there are, uh, you do kind of have to drag over the terms multiple times. And then you can define your order of events. And there's a lot of choices here. So you can say all of these are drop downs. So we could say the start of, the end of, the first of, or the last of, or any. Event one, event two, occurs before, occurs on a four, occurs simultaneously with, occurs after. So there's a lot of choices. But I'm going to go ahead and say um, the start of the first ever event one occurs before the start of the first ever event two by greater than or equal to 30 days. And I can run this. And I'm going to go ahead and save a patient list and show you what we can do with it. So typically, when I hit run query, you saw that there's a patient list, the number of patients, and a timeline. And typically, when I um, do set up the defined sequence of events query, I do run the timeline, and I can show that to you next if this runs quickly. Um, okay. Because that so, kind of plots it out, and you can make sure that you set up your, your constraints right. Go ahead. Okay. So, define sequence of event, uh, that that type of constraint would be the only one that I have to, that I, I need to set up event one and event two, diff multiple different events, and then, um, and then uh, request which, how, how I want them to um, do the query, right? The other ones are not this way. Exactly. Yep, you got okay. it. So, the other ones are, you don't need the events. Um, I see. But yeah, I see. This okay. one, you do have to define the sequence of events. And I think um, what I typically recommend for our users, if they have something very straightforward, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead and set it up in a defined sequence of events. But a lot of times, researchers have a lot of a lot of questions about, um, you know, this has to happen before by so many days, and this has to happen after by so many days. I think that the um, I2B2 interface, I think it's uh, too difficult to set up multiple um, uh, like okay. defined sequence of events uh, that you ha would have to. So if you have like 10 different criteria, I think that that's better done on the raw data once you get it back, such as oh. we recommend using SQLite to clean up data when we give it to researchers. Right. Um, but definitely for simple things like this, it's a great tool to be able to, to narrow down your cohort even further. Right, so the maximum number of events would be two or three, maybe. Yeah, I think, well, okay. in the drop down, you actually only have two. So that's two, the way okay. that, yeah, I see. event one and event two. So, okay. um, that's already very helpful. Okay, great. Yeah, gr great. Yeah, thank you for your question. Let's, yeah, definitely welcome everyone's questions what about that the, they have. What about the second option right above the defined sequence of events? I didn't. Not that oh. one, right? in the pull down. Yeah. It's the, it groups occur in the same financial encounter. Um, uh -huh. So that 
where you're looking at things that happen maybe during a hospital length of stay or during, um, mm, you know, okay. an outpatient visit. So you might say, um, you know, you want things to occur at that time. So everything, um, at least locally, and I imagine the other sites do the same thing, we get encounter numbers. So mm -hmm. um, ideally, everything within a hospital visit would have the same encounter number. So basically then it's saying, are these two things happening during that encounter? So yeah. this is what happens when it times out. It says your query has kind of gotten some rescheduled from in the background. The result will appear in previous queries. So we'll see the results later. Unfortunately, it's Sometimes it's the system is very fast and sometimes it's a little slower. So sometimes they do time out. So um, when it times out, it's just processing in the background. And when it's done, we can go back to, um, under the previous queries and see the results will be there. Is that what you mean? That's, exact, that's exactly right. So if I were okay. to pull up, um, not that one, this last one that I'd run, we can see if it's finished. So now it has finished. And I, I told um, everyone on the phone that I promised them that the answer would be 8,739 with the addition of gender, and that's what the answer is. So it is now finished running in the background. So yep, there's the, there's the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you are very welcome. I'm going to delete group five. There's an X right here, and I just clicked it to clear it out. Um, and I'm going to see if I can, I'm even gonna delete group four, and I'm gonna run this, and say, diabetes patient list. I'm going to show you a couple of things that we can do with the patient list. Helpful. Are there other questions? Do you have other specific questions, Cindy, about things that you'd like to see or um, anything else? If others don't have questions, um, I just would like uh, one very quick question. Um, yeah. I, I missed when you were doing the treat independent, the very top, the very first uh, option. Uh, logically, uh -huh. I, I how what are you treating independent? I, I'm confused usually when I should pick independently and what the, those little pull downs in the each category. Yeah. When would you, so the, yes. So to treat independently, I would say is kind of your most like standard query that you're going to do. And that's just saying that these things happen at any time, right? They don't have to happen at the same time. So you know how we just talked about the occurs in the same financial encounter all happening within a hospital visit or within an outpatient visit. Um, that's what the same encounter is. So treated independently is just saying, I don't care if they're in the same encounter or not. So they might be in the same encounter, but they might not be. So we're just not going to limit it if it's only in the to only being in the same encounter. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, the three yeah. options are basically uh, pinpointing what, how you want to frame the time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I got it. Yep. Okay. So got if it. you want, and and then you can also when you say select the first occurrence in financial encounter, that then allows these drop downs to be changed for each group independently. So you can say some things are. Um, are in the same encounter and some things are not in the same encounter um so you can kind of kind of do that as well mm -hmm. i see got it thank you um you are very welcome so up here we have our analysis tools and we have a couple we've got port query which allows queries to be moved from i2b2 instances so here locally we have our our public facing i2b2 which we call heron um, and that is um, just completely de-identified. We also have another version that is identified, and so oftentimes we'll be moving I2B2 queries between our de-identified version and our identified version, and the support query allows you to do that. Um, we also have a demographic plugin, which is why I was saving this patient set. I, I clicked on patient list to save, but it seems to be taking a long time, so I'm gonna have to find something smaller to save the patient list of and show you what the demographic, the demographic tool looks like. We also have the demographic tool for um, two patient sets, a timeline, and data builder. Um, so let me just see. This is going to time out. Um.
I'll go into share site summary and choose, um, these are patients who've had cancer in our cancer registry. And I'm going to look at um, people with myeloma. And I'm going to run this query and save the patient list. So we've tagged myeloma. Um, all of our facts here have how many facts we have and how many patients we have with it. So the uh, query returned exactly what I anticipated, 1,754. And I did save a patient. List. So if I open up my previous query down here, I'm gonna open up the resize workspace to make it larger. And then if I open up results, you'll see there's a patient set and then the number of patients. So I can go into analysis tools and I can click on demographics and I can drag my patient set over to the specified data for the patient set and click view results. And now we can see an age breakdown. So we can see, you know, there are 474 who are 70 to 80 years of age, um, 977 who are male, so slightly more male than female. Um, there are various races. At means unknown. We don't know what their race is. We've got their language. We have their marital status. So married, 848 are married. Um, their religion, um, have 168 who are Baptist. So there's a lot of information. And we also have deceased. So um, yes, deceased, no, they are not deceased, and then unknown. So about 50 50. Um, so that's a great um, when people are looking at you know, writing a grant, um, just to have some basic demographics is really helpful. Now, if I wanted to take this query and move it uh, using the port query, I can click on this button that says show XML stack. I'm going to clear it out. This has a whole bunch of, from everything we've been running, it's got a whole bunch, so I'm just going to click, click clear and say okay. And I will re-drag over this query and click on the show XML stack again. Now I only have four things. And I can say get request XML. And then here we have a query definition. And so what we do is we copy that between the query definition tag. And I can say port query and I type and I paste that in there and say load query and then find patients and it and it pulls it back up and it says undefined here. So that means it's a new query. Um, so obviously I could have just dragged my query over, um, but that's kind of how the port query works. So it works great between ITB2 instances or to share between sites. Um, we've got the timeline. So I can click on the timeline and drop a patient set. So I can drop myeloma and then I could plot um, I can drag over different concepts, so I can drag over when they have the myeloma, and then maybe we'll also plot um, when they, if they were in the hospital. So I can look at UHC visit details, and then length of stay. And hospital length of stay. Again, I'll just say no value. So any hospital length of stay that they had and click view results. So this will draw up a timeline um, to kind of visualize when these things happened. Now you can also do that when you click run query, you're able to choose timeline. Um, and that's a great way when you're building the query because then you don't have to drag over the patient set and the, and the various concepts that you're interested in. Now the timeline plugin does take a while. Um, Okay, here we go. So again, I can click on this resize workspace and make it be my whole screen. And there's zoom and pan. So I can zoom in and then pan allows me to scroll left and right. So I'm gonna scroll into this area over here where I see a lot of tick marks and then scroll over. And so you'll see each of these is a new patient. So this is one person, this is the next patient. And so this is an 82 year old white female and here are her hospital length of stay. And this, um, this like almost bar shows that this is kind of a longer length of stay than perhaps this one is. So if I click on this, 
So it gives me some information. So it will tell me an event ID, which is their encounter number. The patient ID, again, this is the identified, the concept code, um, the start date and the end date, and then NVAL num. So this is how many days it was. So this one is 17 days. Whereas if you look at this one, where I said it visually looks shorter and I click on it, it was four days. The myeloma diagnosis is here and I clicked on it and you can see what data happened and what the code was and some information. So I can see we didn't see any hospitalization for her beforehand, but then you see she gets the diagnosis and then is hospitalized. Um, that doesn't mean she wasn't hospitalized elsewhere. That's only at KU that we're looking at. Um, we can zoom back out. And then you see various other patients. So it's a great way, like I mentioned before, when you do the defined sequence of events, um, you can, I, I always recommend running the timeline because that allows you to look at, you know, if we had a set up a defined sequence of events where I said the myeloma had to occur after their first hospital length of stay, um, you know, she would not have qualified because her hospital length of stay occurred after her myeloma. And same with this person. Um, so that's a great tool to use as well. Some of the other things that you can do, if I click on find patients again, um, you can say, you can specify a date range. So I might want to say, um, let's look at the year of 2015. I haven't, I got a 2014. We'll look at two years. Um, so we'll look from January 1st, 2014 to the end of 2015 and click OK. And we can run that. So we can see how many patients, so a, a percentage of them, a fraction of them. We're seen in that date range. We can also say, um, if I pull over hospital length of stay, it's frozen. I'm gonna try reloading it and see if it's better. There we go. So, I can go back in and I can, I'm gonna actually grab the just normal myeloma and then all of our hospital lines to say, we could say how many patients have had, let's say greater than two days again, so all my patients have had myeloma with a hospital length of stay greater than two days. And then you could say, I want them to have greater than one hospital length of stay for more than two days. So that means that they would have to have had at least two hospital lengths of stays that were more than two days long each. And we could hit run and see how many patients meet that criteria. So 350 patients. I've had the hospital length of stay more than two days and the myeloma. And, and having the hospital length of stay more than two days twice, at least twice, and myeloma. Is that everything that you can do? Um, let's see if our diabetes, that's still incomplete. Um, in our analysis tools, we do have a data builder. So if you wanted um, to build data, um, you can drag over your patient set. We'll drag over our patient set for myeloma, and then we can drop the query. So when I drop the query, um, it populates everything that was in that query. So this query only had myeloma here. Um, I could have instead, I could delete that, and I could instead drop over this myeloma hospital query, and then it would populate it with the hospital I could say in myeloma. I can chop off our data to be, so that we don't give data um, perhaps this is a retrospective study, um, and the IRB said I, we will only allow them to have data through January 1st, 2018. We can chop up everything that is after January 1st, 2018. We have the option to include MRN or not. 
and we have the option to include contact information, and then we can just save a file name. So I could just give this up my Aloha, and I could click Build Data. And that goes, um, we have a Jenkins job set up to run the data and pull the data for our customers. Um, so that's how we provide, how we pull data here at KUMC. I don't think all sites do that, but if you are, again, if you're interested, um, happy to talk to your site about setting something like that up. Now, one of the other things I mentioned but haven't really talked about that much are these modifiers. So I'm going to open up Diagnoses. And we can look at, um, so here you'll see all of these have these blue circles in, within that folder versus these last couple have uh, like magnifying glasses. So these blue circles are all modifiers and describing where that data came from. So for diagnoses, we've got billing. Um, somebody might only be interested in clinic diagnoses. Um, some might only be interested in the clinical diagnoses, which are listed in the EPIC. So maybe they only want to know people who have diabetes on their problem. Um, we've also got GPC modifiers, and this includes like admission diagnoses. So if people are interested in it being the primary admission diagnosis, they could pull over this modifier. Now, the most important thing to understand with modifiers is it matters where you pull it over from in within the hierarchy. So if I pulled over billing diagnoses from right here, or maybe I'll look at the problem list. We'll look at the problem list. If I were to pull over this problem list, this is saying this would search I2B2 for any patient who has had any diagnosis on the problem list. So we would get a ton of patients back. So I definitely don't want to do that. Um, so instead, what you have to do is you need to open up the folder. So we could go into ICD-10. And um, we'll just go back to diabetes. We'll go to E08 to E13. And so you see underneath each of these folders, when I opened up E0, when I open up ICD-10, I see the modifiers again. So if I were to pull over the modifier from this level, um, it would search all of ICD-10 to say how many have had it on the problem list. If I'm to pull it over under U08 to E13, if I'm to open up clinical and search for that problem list, it would search it for any diagnosis of diabetes from E08 to E13 on the problem list. Maybe I'll get even more specific and say I'm interested in type 1 diabetes with it being on their problem list. So then I can pull over this clinical modifier, the problem list. And now what this is saying is that we want to look for patients who have E10 type 1 diabetes with it listed on their problem list. And we can hit run and see how many patients have it. Um, so 6,908 patients have ever had E10 recorded, but that does not mean it's on their problem list. So 2,500 have had it on their problem list. So that's kind of how modifiers work. Um, we've got those in most of our most of our um, folders. So in diagnoses, it's really common. Medications, we also have it. So in medications, we'll take a look at some of the modifiers we have here. We've got um, the daily dose. Got the dispense medications, historical medications, inpatient medication orders. Here we have the medication administration record. Um, that's part of EPIC. So if your site is also EPIC, you might have some more modifiers or could possibly bring in some more modifiers. So the medication administration record is for inpatients, and we've got the result type. So you could look at patients who've had something given. Um, now, given, there's a lot of different ways that they record given. There's given, given without order, given during downtime, given by patient or family. So there's a lot that you'd have to pull over for every medication that you're interested in. Um, so that's mod modifiers and medications. That's, um, that's largely what I wanted to go over. If people are interested, I can also show what the red cap data looks like. We do get it in a summarized version. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has any specific questions or um, anything that wasn't clear I could go over. Yeah, we can open up for just general questions now. Anybody? Yeah, sure. Wants to raise your hand or ask a question? I 
think that was a great overview, Marin. Thank you. <clears throat> No, I'm not seeing anything. Okay. Well, shall we, um, shall we wrap up? Or anything else you want to mention here? No, that sounds good. We can, okay. we can wrap up. If no one has any questions, um, okay. that's yeah. pretty much you know, an overview of basically how to use I2V2 and some of the right. things that we have at our site. Um, that could be incorporated at various other sites. Okay, super. Um, if you um, if you send me your slide deck, I will get it posted with the recording uh, there. So. All right, sounds great. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for listening and attending today. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, and uh, the recording will be there within a day or so. And uh, there were more training classes coming up, so um, mention it to your colleagues as well. Thank you all very much for for attending. Bye. Bye.